I would like to welcome you all to the webinar today. We are um, going to be talking about um, hydroponics, as you might have guessed. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get going with a few little things, uh, housekeeping items, reminding you that next month we have Laura Vasquez presenting to us on water conservation successes. We're going to be closing out the last few episodes with some Florida friendly um, education programming. So Laura Vasquez is going to talk to us about some of the things that they've done down in um, Miami-Dade County. So I'm excited to have her on board. And remember um, to limit the use of the chat box for asking questions for the speakers and not for side uh, conversations. And you can also use the uh, question answer as well, like Lillian did from Manatee County. Good job, Lillian. And I did want to remind you that the Master Gardener Volunteer State Conference is next month, October 16th through 19th. We've had quite an awesome signups. People are really joining in. Um, Gary Bachman is going to be talking to us. He's one of our keynote speakers, Southern Gardening all year long. And then the Garden Fit PBS series stars, we have Jacqueline uh, or Madeline Hooper joining us. Uh, so if you've ever seen the PBS series called Garden Fit, those TV folks are going to join us. So that's going to be exciting. And we've got great concurrent topics. We've got three topics uh, for the concurrent, um, a food systems concurrent session, advanced master gardening with plant diagnostics, and a little bit more of a deeper dive into some of our education, and then FFL um, educational line as well. So we're going to have a really great conference. Really fun folks are coming to present to us. Remember that if you don't want to come in person to Kissimmee, for the in-person Master Gardener Conference, there is an online option to attend. And so if you'd like to try to do that, that is at the lower cost of $85 for the three days. So if you do like online learning, if that's more convenient for you, um, that might be a great way to go about it. All right, so our, pres our presenter today is Hannah Wooten. Um, she is a UF IFAS Orange County Extension Agent. Um, she is uh, one of our uh, fan favorites as far as hydroponics goes. Some people call her hydroponic Hannah uh, to her face, uh, and she appreciates that. She mostly deals with commercial horticulture in Orange County and urban agriculture and looking to create green, vibrant, sustainable food systems in that urban county. So Hannah, we welcome you today. We're so glad you're here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop share and turn the uh, mic and the video over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you, Master Gardener volunteers for joining us this afternoon. I'm excited to share one of my favorite topics, which is indeed hydroponics. And yes, you see that I am the extension agent of commercial horticulture here in Orange County. And you wonder, you know, why am I teaching hydroponics to, um, master gardeners. Let me just uh, hide my panel here. Okay. Um, and the reason is in urban areas, we don't have tons of agricultural space left, but our yards and even uh, commercial urban agriculture and small spaces can be very productive. And hydroponics allows us to increase our productivity per square foot of space. And space is arguably our most limiting factor in urban areas. So with hydroponics, you can go up and you can really increase your output in limited environments. Um, so today's lesson lesson. We'll talk about all of the basics of how to grow plants hydroponically. These are the rules of green thumb, so to speak. And I'll teach you a method of hydroponics. Maybe you've heard me teach this before that allows you to get your feet wet uh, using an easy, affordable way to grow plants hydroponically in the active growing season or using artificial lights in some sort of an indoor environment. So again, I'm Hannah Wooten and I am from Orange County, Florida. And you know, hydroponics is a great way uh, to see how much you want to be involved with your plants or not. And you can be quite productive being a lazy gardener 
You just have to know and commit to your methods and understand uh, how much involvement you want to have or not have. So today we really want to increase awareness about our agriculture in Florida and our food situation. We want to be able to prepare a nutrient solution for hydroponic lettuce using the measurement tools. We want to understand the role of pH and EC, and these are concepts that are important for growing plants in general, but we'll use hydroponics as the tool for teaching. We want to be able to schedule a planting and a harvest uh, throughout the active growing season, and right now is an excellent time to get started as we are starting to feel the touch of Florida fall in the air is a great time to go ahead and get your cooler season vegetables started. And then I want you just to consider uh, buying more Florida grown produce in general. There are a lot of good reasons for us to buy local. We get more of the total dollar that stays in Florida or in your local community. So independent of growing your own, we want you just to consider consider buying more fresh from Florida products and keeping things more local from an economic and environmental perspective. We want to waste less food. That is probably the best solution, especially in urban areas. Uh, we grow enough food to feed every person on the planet. We just waste it. It's more of an issue of the food system where it's difficult to get all of the food we produce to all of the mouths who need to eat the food in a way that's economically viable and safe. And we want you all to be comfortable planting, harvesting, and consuming your own hydroponic homegrown lettuce continually, maybe even increasing lettuce consumption, which lettuce is um, actually a crop that you can consume. It's normally consumed raw, which allows our body to access a lot of nutrients in their raw form that otherwise can um, change as they get cooked down. So let's dive in and define hydroponics. Hydroponics is derived from the Greek words hydro meaning water and ponos meaning labor. The literal translation is water working, which seems almost magical, but in fact it is just science. It's a method of growing plants without soil using a mineral nutrient solution, either grown directly in water with added nutrients or in some sort of soilless media, something like perlite, gravel, mineral wool, and really, ideally, we want to have something that has fewer uh, charges the way soil, we have cation exchange capacity in our soil, and that can hold nutrients very tightly or not. In hydroponics, we're we want those nutrients to be directly available for uptake in the plants. So using more inert media like perlite, where those nutrients are almost, you know, getting directly uh, put into those plants through the roots by creating the right environment, that is our goal. So the history of hydroponics, it goes back quite a long time. We have the first uh, evidence of uh, hydroponics being used. We have texts that describes the hanging gardens of Babylon using hydroponic methods, where they describe the roots of plants growing in these tower systems being bathed in nutrient rich waters. So then the first real um, evidence uh, archaeological evidence that we have is in 1300 AD, where the Aztec Empire was using this method of carving ditches and canals and purposefully building up organic matter, building these artificial islands that were being irrigated using these very hydroponic techniques where uh, you can see in the imagery that these Aztec chinampas were like little hydroponic islands. And I recently learned these are still around and they're even considered uh, world heritage sites that are very agroecologically uh, productive and abundant. They're very biodiverse. They work with the ecosystem. And it's something that's been productive for now thousands of years, almost a thousand years, I guess. Uh, 
So then uh, we'll fast forward to the 1800s where humans got really advanced in the laboratory. We really started to figure out all the parts and pieces of plants, how plants worked, how they photosynthesized. And we realized we could grow plants in water as long as the necessary nutrients were there. Then fast forward to the 1930s, a University of California professor coined the term hydroponics. So the term is relatively new compared to the practice overall. Funny that California has uh, always been a leader in hydroponics. And then in 1945, the United States employed hydroponic production on Ascension Island for the sake of national security and defense. At the time, hydroponics was still very expensive because it was really reliant on concrete and glass in order to create these artificial environments where we could grow plants in these controlled ecosystems. So in the name of national security, still to this day, we take a spare no expense attitude. And when it comes to feeding our soldiers fresh produce out in the middle of the ocean, this was something that was important to our military. Fun fact, in 2019, you can see that those greenhouses on Ascension Island were revitalized and they continue to be hydroponically productive in the middle of the ocean. A few years later, we had a huge advancement. It's called plastic. And while we have most certainly uh, overused plastics because they are incredibly convenient and affordable, we need to recognize the role of plastics in technology and the ability to make things more affordable from medicine, think, you know, IV bags and lines and that we use in medicine all the time. Then think about agriculture, think about irrigation and piping and greenhouse rooftops. Um, we have different materials. We used to only have glass. So it was just a few years between when hydroponics went from crazy expensive to technology now making things more affordable and accessible. And we've continued to have decades of more advancements in botanical research. And we have new and improved technology like pumps, timers, plastic plumbing, solenoid valves, and artificial lighting, which allow for almost complete automation. So from a commercial standpoint, that's beneficial because labor and land are the most expensive of things associated with growing crops. On a personal level, this means that we as home gardeners can be highly productive with less labor involved in our own crops that we're growing at home in addition to full-time jobs and lifestyles. So this is just an image I like to share of those Aztec chinampas, and I really need to add one now that I've learned <laughs> they're still around. Um, we could go on a field trip to visit these still agriculturally productive hydroponic islands that essentially would use the waste that the nutrients that would accumulate from the civilization, those nutrients get into the water. Hmm, we still have some of these challenges today. And look, the Aztecs were then using that nutrient accumulation to feed those plants. Benefits of hydroponics. This is where hydroponics gets really cool. And for sure, like soil is amazing. Um, I don't wanna knock soil at all. We just have a situation, a global food situation, even a local food situation that um, means that we really should consider some different ways of growing our foods. And, um, the benefits include that we can grow the same yields as conventionally produced um, foods or even stuff in your garden or in conventional ag using up to 95% less water and 80% less land. That's massive. We have efficient fertilizer use. We can almost, com we can completely contain the fertilizer in some systems and we can minimize the amount of fertilizer that leaves the root zone of the plants to be very minimal, like less than 10%, where in our soil-based systems, we might be losing 40 to 50%, even when we're using best practices. Those nutrients are not all getting taken up 
by the roots of the plant. That is just one of those realities and we see how that impacts our water quality. So the efficient fertilizer use piece for hydroponics is huge, huge. And a growth cycle that is twice as fast as soil is achievable where we have some growers that are able to crank out lettuce in four to five weeks from seed to harvest. Um, and they're even working on making things faster. Is that something that is maybe economically viable? There's gonna be a lot of inputs like wavelength specific artificial lights, creating a perfect growing environment and using incredible genetics to achieve that faster growth cycle. But it's interesting to consider the role of biological technology and actual uh, equipment technology that can help us to grow things faster. We can be successful growing hydroponically without the use of herbicides or weeding and reduced use of pesticides. There are ways that you can reduce the amount of pesticides to stay very organic or what would be certifiably organic. Uh, the main ways we're successful is because we're separating the plants from the soil. And a lot of those pesky pests out there will spend a portion of their life cycle in the soil. Uh, furthermore, when we add extra protection like screens or greenhouses, we can prevent the little things from getting into the greenhouse too. Those piercing, sucking insects like aphids and white flies. And then we can use uh, some really impressive integrated pest management to lower the amount of chemicals that are going onto our plants. Bad news is you have to clean your systems. So you replace weeding with cleaning. <laughs> so pros and cons. This can be successful on non-arable land, urban areas, indoors, brownfields that have been affected by pollution and even unsuitable climates. Um, does anyone know who's the most advanced in the world with hydroponics? Because they have a very unsuitable climate, not much water. It's Israel. Israel is incredibly advanced hydroponically and that's because they are very arid. Here in the United States, Arizona is a leader in hydroponic growing and research, and that is because it's a very arid water limited climate. Um, we see how things are shifting though, and Florida, while we do have water, we need to use water appropriately. We need to be smart so we don't end up in any situations that we've seen happening further west. Ultimately, hydroponics can create a self-sustained city-based food system with less strain on distant farms, transportation, carbon emissions, and habitat. And guess what? They're the closest farm to my office and that I'm a few miles from the Orlando International Airport. Closest farm is a half mile away. It's in a warehouse facility and it does not use a single drop of sunlight. They're cholera, they grow 54,000 heads of lettuce every week and supply almost every Publix in the state of Florida. And they look no different than any other warehouse operation in this facility. They use significantly less water and nutrients, but they do use a whopping load of energy for their artificial lights. But it's pretty fascinating to see where things are going. There are trade-offs, I've already alluded to some of them. Upfront cost is one consideration, but that just means planning. There are some things that can be way expensive, um, even working in soil-based systems. Uh, energy cost, a lot of hydroponic systems need to be plugged in. I'll show you a method that does not need to be plugged in today, but most of them do, so the energy is happening, even if you don't see it happening you're paying for it. It requires technical knowledge, but I do hope to make things more uh, microwave dinner ready than Michelin star restaurant hydroponics. There really is a wide range of how uh, simple or advanced you can get with this. And sanitation and care needs to happen. 
Uh, we replace weeding with sanitizing and scrubbing and floods can happen. So I wouldn't put a hydroponic system on a nice wood floor. Um, some things can break, power surges can happen. If you have more total volume of water flowing through your vertical system, then what can be held in a reservoir tank underneath the system, you get a power surge, the power stops working momentarily, but gravity doesn't. All the water will come back down and it will overflow in just a moment notice. These are the mistakes that new growers will make and those are expensive mistakes. That's where I think you see the upfront cost is more of a troubleshooting thing too. That's why it's good to come to these classes. And then if you're really thinking of elevating your level either for personal consumption or even like small scale side hustle. It looks like you're going to have some uh, presentations at your state conference this year about urban food systems and what you can and can't do with the food that is abundantly growing in your own yards. Um, so always want to acknowledge those things. So why do we even care about growing things differently? Well, I mean, one, it is clean. <laughs> when you harvest a hydroponic head of lettuce or tomatoes, it is a lot cleaner. There's not little pieces of soil in there, but there's a much bigger picture for us to consider. And it's our global food and population situation. Our population is increasing from seven to about 10 billion by 2050. Here in Orange County alone, we're getting another 700,000 people within like the next decade. It's we're growing like crazy. A billion people on the planet currently suffer from hunger and 12% of Floridians are considered food insecure. It's not an over there issue. It's a right here issue. And habitat loss is considered the leading cause of the loss of biodiversity. And I'll say that personally, when I was realizing that uh, studying agriculture was not only my passion, but my mission in life, it's because I love nature. I'm a nature girl and I do not wanna see one more tree or swamp cut down or paved. And that means that we need to grow better. And with hydroponics and reconsidering how and where we grow food can help us to get the food that we grow to the people who need it. And right now we already grow enough food. We need to connect the dots of the food system. Ag does uh, produce on a ton of land and it's highly productive. Um, and it's how we get food predictably and affordably. Now, that's impressive. Ag as it is, is impressive. But we know we're growing and we know we don't have more area to expand. We can not cut down the lungs of our world. <laughs> that's the rainforest. Food travels an average of 1,500 miles between the farm and your trash can. This contributes to greenhouse gases, nutritional loss, and food spoilage. So here in Florida, we have the second highest value of vegetables in the U.S., and ag is the second largest industry in our state. And farms in urbanizing counties face long-term challenges to be more sustainable. In fact, the American Planning Association has a textbook. Uh, there's about three pages in the whole textbook about agriculture, and they're important pages. The American Planning Association is educating their planners to consider ag in and around urban areas. In fact, they consider ag land in and around urban areas to be the most important agricultural acreage. It's because it's the fastest acreage getting converted to non-farm uses, uh, over a million acres annually. This is the farmland that's closest to where people live, work, and play. We need our food to be closer to where people live, work, and play. We need to think about our water situation. 
Did you know that half of Florida's drinking water goes to keeping turf grass lawns acceptably green? And if we do not plan now to conserve water, prioritizing human drinking water and water for growing agricultural crops, our second largest industry, we really need to think about where and what we prioritize our water resources for so we have it now and into the future. No need to completely freak out. We have technologies like desalination and we do know how to clean turds out of water, but you will be paying three times the price for drinking water that once had a poo floating in it. So it's important for us to recognize that we need to be a part of the change that we want to see. And that by taking a more conservative approach with our water now means that we will continue to have these resources into the future. Hannah, thank you for that beautiful sermon. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, no so uh, on that last slide, the, the, we're still seeing that black bar it seems to be moving around. And um, so on the, so if you could make sure that if you, I don't know if there you know wh where it is, we can maybe try to get rid of it, it or uh, just if, if it is obscuring it just to make mention of it. So, oh, you did it. You got rid of it. Good job. Yes. Okay. I found Good job. It. I just and then I want to uh, congratulate you for <laughs> being the first uh, presenter to say turd on our webinar. So thank, thank you. That. You know, all right. Thank you so much for fixing that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Sorry. I just needed to concentrate for a second. Once you get going, it's, but thank you. We're good. We're even better. All right. <laughs> uh, so I don't want anyone to feel um, like crisis mode. I want everyone to know there are a variety of solutions and whatever way that you can be a part of the solution is just fine. Um, judging people for their food values, you know, we don't know what people's resources are. So A, you want to do the best you can. That is all that we can truly ask. Whatever that is for you is something worth celebrating. Some ways you can do that, growing your own, buying local, growing hydroponically or organically. Organic, that's going to focus on getting more carbon into our soil. We can integrate organic methods into conventional technologies, precision agriculture, and genetically modified organisms. We don't have time to take that deep dive today, but we really need to have an all horses running approach to research and development. And then let's see where there are the best applications and solutions. All horses running. We need to reduce food waste, increase purchasing fresh from Florida, and your personal values might play a big role in your food choices. That's just fine. Everyone has values and preferences. It's cool that people are starting to care more about food to where they do have values and preferences. So again, food waste is our biggest opportunity. 40% of edible food is wasted between the farm and our trash can. It's considered the third largest greenhouse gas producing country is food waste. So we can do a lot just by approaching food waste better, um, eat your leftovers, you know, little steps can go a long way. And of course, if your food does spoil, compost it. So now let's dive into the hydroponic growing, the science behind this stuff. Uh, it really is driven by photosynthesis. So I want you all to always think about what are the basics, basic needs of the plant. It's carbon dioxide. Uh, we have too much of that in our atmosphere. So plants are here to solve those problems. We have water and sunlight or energy from an artificial life source, light source that gets converted to sugars and the byproduct of oxygen, which those plants get rid of. Lucky for us, we humans breathe it. Plants cannot survive off of a diet of only light. They need balanced nutrients. 
There are 17 essential nutrients for the plant. That means the plant needs all 17 of them in order to complete its healthy life cycle. Those nutrients are obtained through the water, air, and soil. And in hydroponics, we have to supply all those nutrients to the plant and the pH must be balanced in order for nutrient uptake to occur. We need to provide a supporter anchor to the plants because we don't have soil and airspace and oxygen for the plant's roots. There's little pore spaces, little air spaces between the soil particles. That's where the water gets held. The air is also important for the plants, not just for holding water, but for holding air. Our, our roots need to breathe. That's why when you think of most hydroponic systems, there's pumps or like fish tank bubblers where you'll see the air aeration stones bubbling up. That's to provide the air to the roots of the plants. And that's why most hydroponic systems need to be plugged in. I will show you one method that can break those rules. So just to reinforce the concepts, water up through the roots, carbon dioxide in the air, energy from the sun or an artificial light source. And this is also important for thinking of when you're troubleshooting, a lot of people wanna find that right amount of light for the plants. And that is an important piece. Plants see light differently than us humans. So there are essential nutrients for the plant and the plant nutrition, um, this is just a representation of the proportions of nutrients required for citrus, but you can really see that the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, that's the meat and potatoes for the plant. The plant eats the most of those nutrients. Secondary are still important, so are the micronutrients. We just need those in smaller quantities. So this is where people usually get nervous with hydroponics. It's measuring nutrients. The method I'll teach you today, you can use teaspoons and tablespoons. It's uh, like the microwave dinner version of hydroponics. So if electrical conductivity and total dissolved solids are already confusing you, hold and just fast forward to the final bullet, read the label. But if you are already getting curious about hydroponics and want to know more, as you get more advanced, you really should have a way to measure your nutrients. Electrical conductivity or EC is used almost exclusively by commercial hydroponic growers, and it's used in university documents and publications. It's unambiguous, it's an industry standard, and there are no conversions. The meters are available online. They are not commonly available in your local hobby hydroponics store. Total dissolved solids, on the other hand, or TDS, is frequently used by hobby growers. So as you get curious on the World Wide Web and start meandering into questionable websites with palmately leaved plants, you'll see a lot of stuff about TDS. That's where a lot of the hobby hydroponics growers um, gain their experience. These are sold in the stores and online, and online forums usually reference experiences working in TDS, total dissolved solids. Unfortunately, it's ambiguous and it's calibrated in at least two different ways. So I might have a meter calibrated one way, stuck in the same nutrient solution as one of you, and they would read maybe 200 to 400 points difference. So you need to know what you're working with. If you are going more commercial, the EC route has advantages. I would get used to using one of them and keep good records with the one that you're using, but recognize there are little differences here. And if, again, if reading the nutrients is a little too much, or, you know, there's more money, these things cost money from 60 to $360 a piece for these things. I prefer waterproof, I'm clumsy, um, but you can just read the label. A lot of the labels these days, in addition to uh, fancy artwork, also have pretty good directions about dosing rates because they want you to be successful. So we've got our nutrients, but the nutrients can only be taken up by the plants if the pH is within the optimal range, which is between about five and a half and six or six and a half is even pretty decent. And if the pH is not in that right range, some stuff could get locked out. 
So in lettuce, lettuce is pretty forgiving. It can have a higher pH and it can still get the stuff that's necessary. But you start growing flowering and fruiting plants like tomatoes and strawberries, they need phosphorus and they're growing babies. So just like a pregnant mother has special dietary needs and frequently will take a prenatal vitamin, think about flowering and fruiting plants having additional needs. It's because they're carrying the next generation on them. So they're gonna be higher maintenance. That is why I don't typically recommend starting with flowering and fruiting crops. Just keep it simple and start with a lettuce or a leafy green. And that's where we bring all the concepts together and set it and forget it. Where you can see that we can take a bucket or anything that holds volume and we can fill it up almost to the top with water, adding nutrients and pH balancing with a household acid like a white distilled vinegar. Carbon dioxide is in the air all around us. And if you're like me, you also talk to your plants, which is a little extra CO2 love for them. And then sunlight or energy from an artificial light source or from the sun uh, is important. And then we provide a supporter and anchor for the plant. We use net cups when we're growing in a solution. In this case, the lid is also providing some support. And then we can't forget about the airspace or the oxygen in the root zone. As this plant starts, the water and nutrients will be up at the top. The roots will tap in. And as the lettuce grows larger, the water and nutrient solution will lower. And you really can set it and forget it. So now um, I do have a blog on this, but I'm also going to play you my YouTube video so you can do this Hydroponics at home. Hydroponics can be a great, easy, and affordable way to grow your own food. Today, I'm going to show you how you can grow great looking lettuce just like this hydroponically at your own home. All you have to do is set it and forget it. I'm with Orange County now. <laughs> The first step for growing your hydroponic lettuce is going to be starting your seeds. Here, we're gonna be using these Oasis grow cubes to get these seeds started. You're going to start by soaking those grow cubes in water and getting them completely saturated, just like this. Once your grow cubes are completely saturated, you can remove them and prepare them for planting with seeds. Today, we're gonna to be using green butter bib lettuce. These are pelleted lettuce seeds, which just makes handling a little bit easier. And with fresh seeds, you can just place one seed per cube. And if your seeds are a little bit older, it might be a good idea to place two per hole. Now that we've planted our seeds, they're gonna be ready to germinate. So you're going to put them back into a container. We're gonna reduce the amount of water in that container because we don't need it to, we don't want the seeds to be completely flooded, but we do want them to have some water and some high humidity in there. So you can place those seeds in the container cover it to keep that humidity high. And we're gonna wait about two to three weeks while these seeds turn into little baby seedlings where we will then transplant them into our buckets. While your seeds are in germination, you're gonna have a little bit of prep to do. So right now we are going to drill some holes in our five gallon bucket. We are using a power drill with a two inch hole saw drill bit to drill out the holes in the lid of our bucket. We're gonna be drilling out three holes today so we can plant three heads of lettuce. It's good to stabilize the bucket and stabilize the drill using a little bit of pressure here. Just like that. When your lettuce seedlings are ready, it's gonna be time for you to make your nutrient solution. There are gonna be a few steps involved in making a proper nutrient solution for your lettuce. First, you're gonna fill up your five gallon bucket with water, almost to the top, but not quite. You wanna leave about an inch of space. 
that's gonna provide the air which is necessary for your lettuce roots to grow successfully. In order to make a proper nutrient solution, we need to add nutrients to the water because that's how the plant can have a healthy, balanced diet. But we also need to balance the pH or the acidity of that nutrient solution so the plants are able to access those essential nutrients. These are some fancy meters that you can buy to measure your pH and the amount of nutrients in your hydroponic solution. But today, I'm gonna teach you how to make those measurements with teaspoons and with very affordable pH strips. It's a good idea to go ahead and test the level of your pH first so you know where you're starting. We're gonna use these very affordable pH indicator strips where you just put it in the water, lay it, to compare the color. And you can see we have a pH of about seven right now. That's neutral. We want a pH that's in the range of about five and a half to six. So now we're going to add our nutrients. The nutrients are going to help to lower the pH a little bit. Then we're gonna add our vinegar to drop the pH to our desired range of five and a half to six. So we're gonna start by adding five teaspoons of the nutrients. And now we're gonna add 10 teaspoons of the vinegar. This is white distilled vinegar. Now I'm just gonna give it a quick stir to evenly distribute the nutrients and that acidic vinegar throughout the solution. Now let's see what our pH looks like. Looks like we're right there between five and six. Now that our nutrient solution has been pH balanced with our nutrients added, it's gonna be time for us to place our seedlings, which are now about two to three weeks old. Now we're going to take that lid that we drilled those three holes in with the two inch hole saw, and we're gonna place it on the top of our bucket. And we are going to take these two inch net cups to place in these two inch holes. You can see that the water level is up about halfway on these net cups. That's important so that our seedlings can remain in contact with the nutrient solution so that they can get off to a good, healthy start in this bucket. Now we're going to take these seedlings. You can see they're already rooting out here and we're gonna place them right here into our nutrient solution. At this point, your lettuce is gonna be ready to set outside in a sunny location in the whatever months are your lettuce growing season. Here in Florida, that's gonna be in the fall, the winter, and the beginning of the spring where your lettuce can grow happily and healthily outside. Your lettuce is gonna be growing outside for about another three, maybe four weeks, and then your lettuce is gonna look like these examples over here. Now the real trick with the success of set it and forget it lettuce is that those seedlings that you started over here are gonna push their little roots right down into the water and nutrients. And while your plant is actively growing and taking up that water and nutrients, that water level is going down. So you really can just set it and forget it. Now your set it and forget it lettuce is gonna be ready to harvest. But don't forget to harvest it. I know your lettuce looks very beautiful and it's tempting to wanna to just show it off to everyone. But now you're gonna to want to harvest your lettuce so that you can enjoy what you've grown over the last few weeks. So here, we're just gonna take some scissors. We're gonna harvest this whole entire head today. And we're just gonna cut at the base 
of the lettuce plant. We're gonna move that lettuce right here to a bowl where it's ready for dressing. I hope you found the set it and forget it hydroponic method to be an easy, affordable, successful, and delicious way to grow your own food. I'm Hannah Wooten with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Seminole County. If you would like some more information, please feel free to reach out. Thanks and have a great day. All right, so that really is the method that can get you growing using hydroponics. And there is a blog that includes uh, this method and includes the YouTube video, the materials, frequently asked questions and some troubleshooting tips. And there are some ways that you can either make it smaller and more simple. You can do this in a one gallon recycled jug. That's a great way to bring this into classrooms and schools and even reduce the cost even more. Um, and you can increase your size. You can work with things like baby pools. Um, that starts to become even a small scale commercial setup. You know, can you harvest and consume 10 heads of lettuce in a week? I know some of us could, but you know, you're starting to get to a scale within the size of a baby pool where you could have maybe six baby pools slinging, you know, 10 heads of lettuce per week as a small scale uh, farmer's market or something to support your local church community or even more of a food banking type of a thing. Um, so the potential really is endless. And of course, things can get a lot more complicated from there. Um, I've got some information about starting seeds methods, and um, these are all examples that have been submitted to me of people who have been very successful with this method. Um, and then honestly, I see the method continuing to be used year after year, just from my friends, my master gardener friends on Facebook and other uh, horticulture and hydroponic folks. So um, please, I encourage you to give things a try. Um, and with this method, you get to eat your mistakes. So at this point in time, I know you guys are all incredibly knowledgeable and probably have some questions that we want to get through. So thank you, oh. everyone. Oh, it was awesome, Hannah. I, very, uh, very invigorating, very inspirational. I think everyone is excited. So um, we do have a lot of questions. And um, so we're going to kind of dive into them. And if and if the answer to them is that it's in the blog, you can give a short response and then tell them, go check that blog that um, that Melissa was so kind enough to pop in the chat box. And Melissa, if you'll pop it, pop it again in the chat box. So it's at the uh, right at everyone's uh, fingertips. Um, so one of the questions was, do you need distilled water or can you use tap water? Um, you can use tap water. Um, I, yeah, and I think if you are seeing that there are issues and you're following all the steps right and water seems to be an issue, then you might wanna take some steps. The real, uh, you wanna think about cost in these things. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Um, and then we had a question earlier about uh, rain barrel water that's been collected or AC condensate water that's been collected. What are your opinions on those? So those things, while they could uh, successfully provide water to your plants, there are some additional concerns more from the food safety perspective where uh, rain barrel water or other uh, drippings are really not recommended for food crops. Okay. Um, does that container need to be food grade? That's a great question. Um, I do always use food grade containers in classes. Um, there really isn't much research out there on that. And the, so far the understanding is that what might be leached from plastic isn't taken up in the plants, um, but that is an area that 
could use more research. If it's a concern for you personally, definitely use a food grade bucket. Uh, I know a lot of you are incredibly creative and I've seen some of y'all recycle old kitty litter buckets successfully for hydrogen hydroponics. So you do you. And if that is a concern, it's reasonable, um, but we really don't have much solid science on it. So tell your friends and kids and stuff to study that for us. <laughs> All right. And I noticed that you used a Dynagros uh, nutrient solution. Um, what, what was the name of that nutrient solution? That is their Foliage Pro, the Dynagro Foliage Pro. Um, the real key, uh, you know, we're not here to endorse anything specifically. Dynagro Foliage Pro, it's a leafy, hence foliage. It's not pushing for flowers and fruits. So it just has those um, nitrogen, more focused on nitrogen and balanced potassium, a little bit of phosphorus in there. Um, but there are other things, Maxi Grow and General Hydroponic Solutions. The main thing is something that's general or all purpose or something specific to foliage or leafy greens. Uh, the thing with stuff that is in solution, a liquid fertilizer versus granular, it's going to come down to a cost and mixing stuff in. You're paying to ship water weight, but it's going to be really easy to mix into your solution. Uh, compared to granular, it's going to be a little more affordable, but you're going to have to kind of like really get in there and make I sure see. it gets in solution. Gets dissolved, right? Yes. Um, so the uh, lettuce that you clipped off um, would that regrow from the, from the roots? Yes, it will regrow from the roots. And this is where, uh, my mom comes to my classes and then she, she breaks all the rules. So, um, she's just like, oh, I'm just going to refill it and see what happens. And it's pretty decently successful, but as soon as you start bending or breaking the rules, reduce your expectations. You never know. You might find something new and novel. That's amazing, but you might screw it up. Um, the real thing is the quality of the lettuce is reduced that second generation. So it's going to taste more bitter. My mom doesn't care. She likes that it's free, but some people are going to be like, Ooh, that's off putting. And they're going to hate lettuce forever after that experience. So, and in the same vein, um, would you reuse the nutrient solution in that bucket? Um, that I wouldn't recommend it. I would use, dump the rest of the nutrient solution into other plants. And that's just because we don't know how much of which nutrients the lettuce was taking before. So even if there's still some nutrition in there, it might not be the same balance as when you started. This is one, again, if you're going to bend or break the rules, just learn from your mistakes or successes. Okay, great. Um, so um, the next one is about leaving these um, buckets outside in the Florida sun. Um, I think they're concerned about algae growth. And then I have a question from Bob Pryor down in Charlotte County, worried about the temperature of that water as well. Yes. So darker buckets are better. Uh, we do want to prevent light from penetrating that nutrient solution. That's where algae happens. So a darker bucket is better. Um, and then temperature, that's why growing in season is important or creating an artificial environment. Um, but people get creative and even do you know geothermal cooling where they'll dig a hole and put the bucket in the hole and use the cool environment around. The di that's the difference between maybe a master gardener volunteer and a commercial operation too. It's not gonna, maybe not reasonable for someone to be digging holes on a commercial scale like that. But in our backyard, maybe we can extend our season slightly by getting creative. So great, great question. Um, Yvonne Florian is wondering, is there that whole five gallon bucket is a lot of nutrient for just those three lettuce plants. Is there wasted nutrient there? Um, could you do it in a sh more shallow bucket? Has anyone tried to figure out how much, uh, how many gallons is necessary to go three heads of lettuce? Yes, uh, Dr. Bernard Kratke of the University of Hawaii is the one who demonstrated and proved this method is highly successful. 
example, and he found that an, uh, one head of lettuce takes 1.6 gallons of water between the seed germinating and harvest. In my experience, I see in a hydroponic system with no added leaching or, evapor or in minimal evaporation, I think it uses a little bit less than that. Um, I see about one gallon per head. So I do ever since I've done this now for years, I think a three gallon bucket for three heads of lettuce would be fine. Um, my colleague for our MGs from Marion County, Jeremy Roden teaches this same method in a square box. And you can easily fit four heads on the square box and it holds four gallons of water. So from a sustainability resource use standpoint, that I think is one step better. So you can have less waste. Um, thing is, the amount of water and nutrients in this hydroponic bucket is significantly less than what you're putting in your garden, where you're mm -hmm. losing a lot of the nutrient it's going in our local water supply, even when you're using your best practices. Okay. All right. Well, you knew that this was coming. So here we go. Um, we have someone who does not want to use any fertilizer. They want to use fish. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's aquaponics and aquaponics, we're now adding fish and that is the most sustainable closed loop way of taking the best of both worlds where we can pair hydroponics and organic methods. The challenge is there are three different organisms involved in an aquaponic situation. We have fish, we have nitrifying microbes, and we have plants. The fish like a slightly different pH than the microbes who like a slightly different pH than the plants. So you're either creating a situation that is most favorable to one of those organisms, and then the other two are just getting the short end of the stick and are not optimized, or you create a general situation where everyone is equally limping. Um, so individually, it is considered more productive to grow your hydroponic plants just in a hydro system and to grow your fish just in a fish system. But we know we have a global food and population situation and increasing circularity is the goal. So it is a, a noble goal. Um, the real challenge, it's also killing fish is completely different than accidentally killing lettuce. So the troubleshooting and learning how to do it successfully and the investment with money, um, you just have to be able to afford the troubleshooting because you're, you're gonna kill fish and you have to be okay with killing the fish while you learn. It's just, sorry. That's okay. Um, do you ever see any insects or disease problems in this system? <laughs> um, the most common pests are Cuban tree frogs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> they love hanging out between the leaves. <laughs> so okay. um, other ones you, you might find if you have deer issues um, and some squirrels. So it's non-traditional pests, but nonetheless pesky. Right. Well, someone to ask, you know, uh, in-ground uh, culture pests versus hydroponic pests. So it sounds like uh, the hydroponic pests are much less than the in-ground pests. I find it to be true. Yes. Okay. All right. Do you have to sterilize the containers uh, before uh, replanting? I think it's a good idea to go ahead and use like a 10% bleach scrub in there. Okay, and what about uh, what cultivars of lettuce have you found that do best? I'm, I'm guessing romaine probably is not gonna be awesome. Yeah, right? romaine is not ideal, nor is iceberg. The, the tighter head sure. isn't super duper. The butter bibs do phenomenally well. Um, Johnny Seeds has a Salanova line of lettuce. That's the one that was in the video that was like an oak leaf looking Salanova. Mm -hmm. It's just gorgeous. You'll pay for the seeds. They're a little more expensive, but it is fancy and it is super tasty. Um, Rex and other standard butter bibs work fine. Um, the Cherokee Summer Crisp 
works well, especially when you're trying to cheat on the fringes of the seasons. Um, and, and I'm trying, I'm currently trying some new cultivars that I'm kind of, I'm curious to see how they'll do. Um, some herbs, some basil is something that can do a little better in the warm season. It'll just get a little top heavy. And that's where things might start falling over where your lettuce stays in a nice short little stubby crown. Mm -hmm. um, so shorter stature, short-term crops are best in these things. Okay. Um, and then uh, the nice little cups that you use for the grow cubes, where do you source, source those? Those can be found on Amazon or Hobby Hydroponic stores. And some master gardener volunteers brought to my attention. They're like, you know, my K cups from my Keurig machine can be used as net cups. So be creative. When I was teaching in jail, the girls started cutting holes into their styrofoam cups. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I've done the styrofoam cheapo way as well. Yeah. And what about the seed, the seed starting uh, squares? Is that the yeah, so those oasis cubes or rock wool, those are more of the industry standards that exist out there. And they have a really favorable water to air holding capacity. Um, that's ideal. Okay. I'm not going to lie. You can try things um, in kind of a more soilless media, even potting mix. A lot of potting media is soilless media. Um, you can try some of those things in these types of systems and you'll get that similar wicking effect um, and it'll probably work pretty darn well. Like I have stuck Bonnie's herbs directly into the tops of these systems just in a three inch hole instead of a two inch hole. With the soil on there are, and everything? or did Yeah, because uh, it's it's a, actually a soilless media that a lot of those are grown in. Sure, sure. So, and sure. since this is, since you guys are master gardener volunteers, that's, I'm, I wouldn't um, be maybe quite as liberal with some of, like just a class of a bunch of newbies to this, but you guys get creative and you guys yeah. already grow plants. So I want to be open, very open and honest with you guys about all the ways you can work with this. Right. So speaking of the creative, the creativity, uh, Janice, um, mentions that you can use slices of pool, pool noodles. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. And yeah. then Bobby also suggested yogurt cups that could fit, um, <laughs> And so, of course, you know, master yeah. gardeners, uh, uh, always innovative. Um, Miriam <laughs> is wondering about tomatoes, peppers, uh, and cucumbers in the Kratky method. And the Kratky method is the more square box, right? Yeah, or it's really just a non-circulating um, hydroponic where we're just get it, making the airspace happen there. The re so while it could be done, you won't be taking advantage of all the optimal benefits of hydroponics. These plants are thirstier plants. So if you use this method with tomatoes, you cannot forget it. You are gonna have to come back like daily and replenish the water and the nutrients. Uh, tomatoes, it's my understanding, they take about 55 gallons of water to produce like one tomato. So that helps us to understand Then you'd have to use a 55 gallon drum just to do the tomato. And then those nutrient requirements change. Remember she, the tomato needs to be able to flower and then get pollinated and then hold the fruit. So you can't just start off with the nutrient solution and keep it the same. It needs to adjust throughout that life cycle as yeah. the tomato or pepper is now retaining the next generation. And what about evaporation? Should you just check and top stuff off if a lot of things are, if the water is uh, evacuated, uh, evaporating? Yes, if water has evaporated, which is more likely to happen on the edges of the season where it's still a little warm, like right now, um, you wanna, you might wanna top it off if the roots are not in contact with the nutrient solution, it might evaporate a little bit faster. Um, but otherwise, once the roots are in there, they will chase the water and nutrients down as it goes down and you won't need to top it off anymore. And then um, I learned from our colleague the other day that a method for overflowing drill a little hole in the top so that we've had an abundance of rain lately 
that I thought was a brilliant adaptation. You can drill a little hole up at the top so that you maintain a high water level that won't drown your plants. And right. that's so up at the top, so like a little overflow hole. Yes, Yeah. exactly. So Good. Um, uh, Lisa wants to know, can you grow anything this way? Um, I would keep stick to short term plants that are shorter stature plants. That's where you will find the best success. Uh, in theory, you could grow anything hydroponically, but is it going to be economically worth it? Um, probably not. You know, Disney demonstrates it, the land all that can be done hydroponically and we're paying for it with that hundred dollar ticket. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they do a beautiful job. That is what's possible. Is that what's economically viable right now in our global food system? Eh, maybe. Yeah. Um, so um, I think we've addressed the cistern versus tap. I think we did address that question. And uh, the Rockwool Medium, uh, there is a lot of um, hydroponic um, retailers now, but also you mentioned the online, like Amazon has a lot of this stuff too, right? Mm hmm Okay. Yes. Um, uh, root vegetables, or this is just not a program for that, right? No, this, because this exact method is solution-based, so your roots would just rot in there. Mm -hmm. But if you use a media-based hydroponic system where you're just growing in a soilless media, then you can grow things like carrots very well, um, like even just in perlite. Uh, again, that's where you want to think carrots grow phenomenally well in soil. Like they're really, really easy and they're going to be dirty no matter what. Lettuce it can be, you know, it's kind of like when, when we harvest lettuce out of the garden, it's usually pretty grody, you know, it requires a good bath before it gets consumed. Hydro, it's a quick rinse and it's ready to go. Um, so think about that. So can you grow carrots hydroponically? You could in a soilless media. Um, is it worth your investment? Maybe, Is it? are you just curious? Cool, think about the resources yeah. and time. Have you had any luck with spinach? Um, I personally haven't tried spinach, but I have heard from other Master Gardener volunteers and other extension agents who have grown spinach successfully. Okay. Um, Lisa specifically would like to see you do the same type of video for strawberries, herbs, bell peppers, and tomatoes. So if you could get that done by this time next year, we would love that to happen. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, the, we have a question I about taste. Uh, any, uh, any thoughts about taste? Have you ever done any taste testing or, you know, hydroponic versus, um, versus in ground? So people have preferences, values, opinions on that. It really seems to come down to cultivar and freshness is the biggest thing. And that could be, you know, soil or hydro, that could be anything. It's really when we harvest and eat something fresh, it's usually better. And certain cultivars just have really desirable qualities and certain cultivars cannot reasonably be shipped long distances. So we don't have access to those flavors mm -hmm. unless we grow them and consume them fresh, either hydroponically or in the soil. So I'd say it's less of this is better or tastier. You might have your own thoughts and opinions. It's probably more that like butter bib lettuce is just really tasty lettuce, no matter where you grow it. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Hannah, but I'm also going to say that, you know, as we get towards the end of the season and plants are getting bitter because of the raising oh. temperature or maybe the stress from the temperature or the weather, the temp, the flavor is going to be better if it's not stressed, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of it from that perspective. Okay. So, so yeah, uh, thank you. My friend Jack has asked this question twice, so I do need to answer it. We need to get it answered. The difference between an EC meter and a uh, PPM meter. Well, it is how the nutrients are measured. Um, one, it, the EC measures in 
um, milli Siemens or micro Siemens per centimeter. It's almost more of a metric system style of measurement. And PPM or um, the total dissolved solids measures in parts per million. And there is just a slight difference between how those nutrients are read and the accuracy of the meters, the EC meter is more accurate and is more correct, but the PPM or total dissolved solids meter is more common. So which one do you use and is it worth the value to use the one you use? Um, I use a combination meter that has EC, total dissolved solids, and pH. And then I like to keep records. Um, so I know how things are performing at different levels. So I think commit to whatever meter it is that you want to use. If you plan on going commercial, I would go EC. If you're sticking to hobby, either works fine. Just start keeping records and really learning um, based off of the meter you're using. The TDS is going to be more accessible and probably more affordable. Um, definitely, if you think you're kind of clumsy, <laughs> consider waterproof. That's the most important takeaway for meters for now. Okay. Um, have um, you heard about good things uh, trying kale or chard? Yes, and yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about bacteria in the water? Have you ever had it go nuclear on you? Um, no, um, I, I have tried doing full hydroponic organic, um, and that has, I think I've grown a new species before, um, where our best nutrients our most soluble form of nutrients for hydroponics. They are synthetic. Um, there is one product, it's a Botanicare Pure Blend Pro that is considered organic by one certifying agency, but it doesn't have all the labels on it. And that one, um, you have to use a slightly higher volume, but it is a very high quality, um, more natural form that doesn't seem to grow new organisms. But that's an area of research that I think, um, I actually, I know of some of our own researchers that will start dabbling in that in the near future, looking at more hydro organic, but that's where things get weird. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what about um, a good source for the towers? Um, well, there are a few different types of towers. Um, and that I really, I do have some presentations about systems. So for those who are really curious about taking things to the next level where we're plugging stuff in and making it go, um, that is a little more complicated and more expensive, um, but there are media-based towers and solution-based towers, and they have pros and cons. It comes down to when things go down like when you have a power surge or the less exciting tasks. Um, if you have a power surge and a solution-based like tower garden, all your plants will die. Or if you run out of water, it is immediate total devastation. A media system will not be immediate total devastation, but you have to buy the media and you have to clean it out every one or two seasons. So that's time and labor. Mm -hmm. So pros and cons. Um, and I would just look online. Um, I think Juice Plus sells the tower gardens. Currently there are Vertigro Towers and Mr. Stacky Towers that are all media based. Um, and just <laughs> shoot me an email if you want more info on the specifics. Okay. Uh, Kara Zimmerman, Zimmerman just endorsed the Juice Plus one. All right. So, but I mean, I know that there's a lot of good systems. It's, it's basically the one that works for you, right? Yeah. And yeah. the one that is the most cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, so my question for you and, a, and for my friend Bob down in Charlotte County is, you know, um, trying to figure out the that cost, you know, how the uh, fertilizer prices have gone way up. Um, you know, I know that the five gallon buckets haven't and the, and the rubber made tubs haven't really gone up yet. Um, but the materials for these things are going to go up, you know, how, how can, is there a, do you have a budget sheet for a homeowner? Is that something that maybe, um, one of our economists could pull together for us? Um, yeah. So this is, it really is about, um, 
$20 in materials to do the bucket. Um, but some of those things are purchased in bulk and then broken out. So if like when I teach a class and buy a slab of rock wool, it has maybe a hundred squares in it. When you buy a slab of rock wool, you will buy all 100 squares. Like I can break those up and share that cost with all of you. But hey, you guys have friends in the Master Gardener program. So maybe you guys can do some things um, to help dilute that cost, go in on that together. Even though a slab is maybe just 10 to $12, if you only need 50 cents of it, to get through a season of growing lettuce in a bucket, um, why not save a couple extra dollars? Right. Okay. Yeah. I like that point. And and to that, Hannah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the last question. If anyone else has more questions for Hannah, please check out her blog. Um, you're always welcome to contact her at the Orange County Extension Office um, and ask her specific questions. But your video to me was very inspiring, and I'd like to talk with the rest of everybody who's on here who is excited about hydroponics. I could see you going into a library, showing that video, or going into a community center, showing that video, and then having the components and doing a hands-on uh, with the residents right in front of them. So you could watch the video and then have some seeds that are already sprouted, show them how to seed, have the sprouts, how to put in, and then the finished product that they could touch as well. And then also think about it perhaps as even a fundraiser where you would show the video, teach the class, and then for a certain amount, people would get to take home the completed project. And um, I think that's a really great way to get people excited about hydroponics and wanting to learn more. So Hannah, do you have any experience with that? Are people doing that in Orange County? Um, a little bit, yeah. This is one thing that went really well when I was still up in Seminole County. We brought this down to the classroom level and we're growing in a one gallon jug. And um, I supported the materials for the master gardeners who did the school gardens programming. We had a few uh, kits that you could sign out and then they were just off to the races with whoever, whatever schools and teachers they wanted to work with and they could do this same concept just in a one gallon jug. Um, and I have started including this in certain um, new master gardener trainings. And I hope and think there's some more opportunities into the future for us to make a more complete package. Um, I do have a Google Drive that I'm working with teachers. Um, we have an ag teacher in every high school here in Orange County, and they have all learned this method and are bringing it into their classrooms this year. So I think we're we're ready for taking things to that next level. And I look forward to working with all of you guys. And you never know who you might inspire. Um, you start looking around on your map. There are people doing all kinds of weird urban agriculture, like weird meaning cool <laughs> urban agriculture and all kinds of odds and ends and nooks and crannies of our urban areas. As long as you're following your local codes and rules, you're allowed to grow food. You just right. have to follow what your HOA says and what your local codes and ordinances say, but food is allowed. So Very good. All yeah. right, Hannah, thank you so much for your thank time you. and attention. Please uh, tell the Orange County Master Gardener Group, I wish I could be with there with them in person. I'm going to be there virtually tonight. Okay, so, I will. Uh, I will. It's going to be right. so much fun. And thank you. This is a all great right. day of lots thank of you. Master Gardeners. So. Yay. Well, we're the best, as you I know. know. All I right. Know. Love you guys. Take thank care, you. everybody. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>